Hey everyone, uh, thanks for showing up bright and early in the morning. I think I'm the very first technical presentation of the day. Uh, hopefully kick, uh, kick off the day in, in a good way. Um, so uh, I am one of the co-founders of Zero X. Uh, started Zero X uh, almost exactly three years ago now. Uh, and the protocol has been live for a little over two years now. Uh, we've had a lot of learnings along the way. Um, and today, I'm going to describe uh, some of the challenges that we've encountered with providing liquidity on decentralized exchanges. Um, and in addition to that, uh, Xerox is actually on the verge of a very big shift. Uh, in a few weeks, uh, if everything goes well, Xerox version 3.0 will be launched. Uh, and this is intended to address some of the problems that I'm going to describe today. So first of all, uh, high-level overview of ZeroX for, for those who are not familiar. Uh, ZeroX is a protocol for decentralized exchange. It is not a single decentralized exchange. We are not running an exchange or anything like that. It is a protocol. What does this mean in practice? Uh, it's made up of various layers of the stack that can be assembled together uh, to exchange value in, in a variety of different ways, and it's very flexible. Uh, to this day, uh, Xerox has done over 713,000 trades, uh, over $750 million worth of volume, uh, and over 30 projects have been built utilizing Xerox. I think these numbers are actually a little bit out of date. Um, volume numbers should be over a uh, billion dollars today. So what are these layers of the stack that Xerox is comprised of? First of all, there is a standard message format for uh, orders. An order represents a, uh, a user's intent to buy or sell an asset or multiple assets at a specified price. Uh, an order also contains other parameters such as like the expiration time for that order. All these parameters are hashed together and they are signed with the user's private key. And then this order, this off-chain order message becomes executable within the Xerox pipeline of contracts. Uh, so this brings me to the, the second layer of Xerox. Uh, there's a system of smart contracts you, uh, used to settle trades over the protocol. Uh, and there are various ways orders can be executed or settled uh, within these smart contracts. Uh, and the, the smart contracts are also used for things like uh, you know, validating the authenticity of orders, uh, or canceling orders. And then finally, uh, this is a relatively new layer of the stack. Uh, there's a peer-to-peer -peer network for distributing these off-chain orders. Uh, so I, I keep saying these orders are off-chain. Uh, what does that mean in practice? Uh, so it means that in order to create an order, that's completely free, which is a, a big plus, helps a lot with scalability um, and, and makes it cheaper to provide liquidity. Uh, the downside to having off-chain orders is that they are not as easily discoverable. Uh, so how do people find these orders? Well, now they could just go to this peer-to-peer -peer network, Xerox Mesh, and access this global pool of liquidity. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about Mesh in a little bit more detail uh, in, a, in a couple more slides. Uh, also, for those familiar uh, with Xerox and those who've been following along all of this time, um, you, you may know of the concept of a relayer. Uh, so relayers uh, were, were kind of the initial vision for uh, how orders should be propagated and discoverable off-chain. Uh, and they still exist today. They will still play a very similar role, the, the difference being that they can now utilize Xerox Mesh to communicate with each other uh, and to uh, you know, kind of bootstrap their order books with this global liquidity pool. Uh, what they can do on top of that is provide nice front ends for their users uh, and provide extra services to their users uh, that they could potentially monetize the liquidity with. So that's a little bit about the technology. I think it's also important to understand why we are building ZeroX. What is our long-term thesis? What is our mission? Our mission is to create a tokenized world where all value can flow freely. So we believe in the long run there are going to be millions or even billions of tokens. And tokens can represent really any value that, that can be digitized. Uh, so as a result of this, I think there are gonna be huge efficiency gains in the world. 
uh, you can have a market for every single token. Uh, this is going to reduce coordination costs throughout the world. Uh, it'll reduce information asymmetry. If you want to know the probability of any given event happening, you can look at the market for it and determine that for yourself and make better decisions because of that. Uh, it also democratizes access to markets. These markets are permissionless and globally accessible. Uh, and this will also be a massive efficiency gain. So in this world where there are millions or billions of tokens, uh, you know, how do we actually create functional markets? What do they require? Markets require sufficient supply and demand in order to function. Uh, on, on the supply side, uh, that, that essentially means that they need sufficient liquidity. And this is the problem we are primarily addressing today. Uh, so people provide liquidity in these markets. Uh, and as liquidity grows, those markets became, be become cheaper to access. And then that draws in more demand and more traders who are able to consume that liquidity. As more demand comes in, that creates more opportunity for liquidity providers. So liquidity providers can now scale up their liquidity. And this is a virtuous cycle where the supply and demand kind of perpetuate each other uh, and, and eventually reach some stable equilibrium um, where ideally uh, you know, these, these markets will be fully functional and offer good prices to end users. Uh, I, I think you know, there, there are two ways of, of looking at this problem. You can either try to bootstrap the liquidity first or bootstrap the, the demand first. Uh, I think you know, in, the, in the crypto space, uh, we're just starting to see natural organic demand come in. Uh, and for that reason, I think it makes sense to address liquidity first. So there are a handful of challenges with providing liquidity on decentralized exchanges. Uh, some of these problems are unique to decentralized exchanges. Some of these problems exist everywhere. Uh, the first challenge I'm going to discuss is fragmented liquidity. This is a problem that we see on centralized exchanges as well, although uh, I think there are arguably better solutions in the context of decentralized exchanges. So here's the gist of the problem. There are many different liquidity pools fragmented amongst many different exchanges. And for an end user, that's undesirable because if they are using just a single exchange, they are going to get worse prices than if they were to aggregate all that liquidity together, right? There's going to be higher slippage on any single exchange. Uh, each exchange or marketplace is also responsible for attracting their own liquidity. Uh, and this is a challenging problem. Uh, and typically we see that you know, there are a very small amount uh, that, are, that are successful in attracting liquidity, and, and it kind of becomes a winner-takes-all market. There are also differences in APIs and the execution models of all these different marketplaces, uh, which makes it difficult for users to interact with all of, this, all of them at once. Uh, and uh, similarly to that, there are many different decentralized exchange protocols. So we are attacking this problem from a few different angles. One, uh, this is what I mentioned a few slides ago. Uh, ZRX Mesh is now in beta, and uh, we're hoping to bring it out of beta in just a couple of weeks, uh, along with the V3 rollout. Uh, it is a peer-to-peer -peer network for distributing orders. Uh, it's optimized for just you know, really quickly propagating these orders. There's no consensus or anything like that. Um, and, and the idea is to create this single global liquidity pool at the protocol layer. Uh, and this liquidity just becomes a public resource that anyone within the protocol could utilize in any way that they like. Uh, I think in the long run, maybe there's like 80% of liquidity uh, kind of aggregating in, in ZRX Mesh, uh, and the rest of the protocol is able to tap into that. And then maybe like 20% or so is proprietary liquidity um, that can only be executed in, in other ways. Uh, Xerox Mesh is also lightweight, and it's able to actually be run in a browser. So you could have completely decentralized applications that tap into the Xerox liquidity pool. Uh, 
The second problem we're trying to, uh, or, or the second solution to the liquidity aggregation problem is trying to incentivize people to actually post their liquidity into ZRX Mesh. Uh, the actual, you know, peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure is kind of just one level of, of this problem. So in version 3.0, uh, we are introducing brand new token economics that are intended to do just this. Uh, so we want to create long-term alignment between the liquidity providers of the protocol and the protocol itself. Uh, liquidity is a very defensible moat for any protocol. It is not something that can easily be forked away. There are also large advantages to uh, liquidity aggregating at a single venue. Uh, we, would, we, we expect that uh, these new liquidity incentives will gradually uh, give market makers a slight edge versus everyone else on the protocol, uh, and in the long run, lead to much larger, more sustainable, uh, and sticky liquidity. Uh, also, these new token economics are intended to give market makers more control over the protocol. Uh, Xerox has a governance system that allows the protocol to be upgraded, and we think market makers are probably the most valuable actor in the ecosystem, and they should have uh, more say over the direction of the protocol than other users. So why do we think it, it's important for market makers to own and operate this protocol? Exchanges do not have aligned incentives uh, in, in the long run. So, uh, you know, there's this problem where an exchange will start up, it might not charge any fees, it has a really good user experience, and uh, they're able to attract a lot of liquidity, and all this liquidity aggregates. But as I mentioned, it's difficult to actually fork this liquidity, and uh, there start to become network effects where you know, it's, it's very difficult for that liquidity to actually leave the exchange. And at that point, the exchange can easily jack up their fees and start charging rent and the liquidity is probably going to stay there, uh, but this will end up costing their users money. So we think market makers have more aligned incentives with the protocol because they, uh, they really want to just see increased volume. Their opportunity is determined by the amount of volume traded across the protocol, right? They just want more trades, they can provide lower spreads and make small amounts on every single trade, and they're essentially making a, a small percentage of volume, uh, and this is directly benefiting the end users. There's also precedent for market makers actually owning exchanges. Uh, New York Stock Exchange, for example, was created by a, a group of market makers that just got together. And then the third way we are uh, addressing the liquidity aggregation problem is by allowing ZeroX to bridge liquidity with other on-chain decentralized exchanges. Uh, so there's a mechanism in 3.0 uh, that allows other DEX liquidity to be represented in the form of a ZeroX order. This becomes a really nice single integration point for developers. They can tap into ZeroX and automatically get the liquidity of all these other decentralized exchanges. Uh, it also allows for really seamless market fills across decentralized exchanges. Uh, so liquidity aggregators these days are getting much more advanced, uh, but uh, in their initial form, what we saw is they would use pretty naive algorithms where they would look at what price you could get on any single DEX, uh, and then they, all of your trade volume would just still go towards one DEX that could give you the best price for all that volume but it wasn't really spread across the decentralized exchanges, so that wasn't really addressing the problem of fragmented liquidity. This new mechanism makes it very easy to do this. Uh, initially, uh, we'll support Uniswap, Kyber, and Oasis out of the box. Uh, I should also mention that uh, these, these bridge contracts are completely permissionless and instant to deploy. Anyone can create their own bridges to any other protocols. Uh, you could even have a bridge to like a, another DEX aggregator if you really wanted. So that's how we plan on addressing the fragmentation issue. Uh, but there are a, a few other issues uh, that, that I think are equally important. So this is a problem that's unique to decentralized exchanges. Uh, centralized exchanges don't really have to deal with this. Uh, slow order cancellations make it more expensive to provide liquidity. On a centralized exchange, you could easily update your price you know, thousands of times a second if you really wanted to. 
And this makes it so that it's unlikely that you will ever get filled at a price that you are not really willing to offer at that time. Uh, so I mentioned that Xerox orders can be created for free. However, that's not necessarily true of cancels. Um, there, there are two ways to cancel orders uh, within the protocol. You can either wait for that order to expire. So this is slow because you have to wait some amount of time. And it's also probabilistic. You don't really know, uh, you know what the timestamp of the next block is going to be. Uh, also, if someone comes in and fills your order right around the edge of expiration, it's uncertain if that order is going to be mined or not. Um, and there could also be you know, small reorgs uh, that kind of end up affecting your, your orders getting filled or not. The second way to cancel an order is with an on-chain transaction. Um, and the problem with this is that they are limited uh, by block times. Uh, so it's going to be a minimum of 15 seconds before your order can actually be canceled. And a lot could happen in, in that 15 seconds. And you're also paying transaction fees uh, for these cancels. These are the only ways to really cancel orders in a trustless way. Uh, there are some other mechanisms that, that we're working on that involve uh, slightly more trust. Um, it's a little bit out of scope for this particular presentation, but if anyone's interested in, in talking through these models, uh, happy to do so after the presentation. So uh, how does this uh, problem actually manifest? Uh, so the price can really quickly move. Uh, market makers are not able to cancel their orders quickly enough. Uh, and these orders get scooped up by arbitragers uh, who, you know, just, just see a, an opportunity to make free money. Um, and, and this ends up setting a lower bound on the spreads that market makers are able to profitably offer. Uh, so prices end up being worse on decentralized exchanges because of this. And this ends up being an implicit tax on providing liquidity. So here's an example of, of what the issue looks like. Um, we have a, a buy order on 0x to, to, to buy Ether at $200, and the price quickly gaps down to $190 on a decentralized exchange. And our bot quickly sees this opportunity, and, and they submit a transaction to purchase, or to, sorry, to sell the Ether at $200. Um, arbitrage bots today make up something like 20, 25% of, of overall DEX volume. It's fairly large, and they are extremely advanced. So then we have another R-Bot uh, who says, oh, like this, this is just a free $10 sitting around? Well, I'm willing to actually only make $8 on this trade. And I'm going to outbid the first R-Bot uh, to do so. So I'm going to pay a higher gas price, and my transaction is going to be mined first. And then we have a third R-Bot who comes in, uh, and they are willing to lower their margins to just $3 uh, in, instead of $8, right? Um, and, and there's this process where, uh, you know, our, our bots are just constantly outbidding each other in order to, you know, get at some amount of margin from this free $10 that's sitting there. Uh, and we can actually see this happen in practice very, very frequently. Uh, as I mentioned, these R bots are, are pretty sophisticated. So the net result of this is the market maker just lost $10, right? Um, they purchased an Ether $10 off of market price. Uh, the R bot paid a large amount in fees, but they still made a little bit of money from the arbitrage uh, net of fees. Maybe they came out ahead $3. And then the miner actually makes the most profit because they scoop up the transaction fees from all of the R bots that participated in this auction. This is known as an all pay auction. Wouldn't it be nice if we could redirect some of the profits from uh, the R bots and the miners back to the market makers, give them a little bit of extra protection? So that is exactly what we are hoping to accomplish uh, with these new token economics in version three. I already explained the rationale for the token economics a little bit when I was discussing fragmentation. Uh, now I'll discuss some of the actual mechanics of the token economics. So every fill charges a small protocol fee that scales with the gas price of a transaction, and this is denominated in Ether. So initially, we're targeting just doubling the overall gas costs of filling an order. Uh, this fee is sent to a liquidity rewards pool, and it's attributed to the maker of that order. And then at the end of a 10-day epoch, staked market makers are able to claim rewards proportional to their fees collected and the amount of ZRX staked. 
so this is a, a diagram of, of what this looks like. Uh, takers pay fees to this liquidity rewards pool, which are eventually distributed back to the market makers. And we're, we're really trying to capture the long tail of fees, the fees that are, uh, you know, they're paying well above average, uh, and these are directed back to the market makers. Uh, and in theory, market makers should actually be able to provide better pricing to takers net of the protocol fee because they are redirecting some of these profits uh, back to themselves. Uh, this is the rewards payout function. Um, if you're interested in learning more about why we chose the Cobb Douglas production function, we, we have a white paper out. I'll, I'll throw up some links at the end of this presentation. I think the most important parameter to look at here is alpha. Uh, so alpha is a weighting towards either providing liquidity or towards the amount of ZRX staked. Uh, initially, the alpha value will be set to two thirds, uh, which represents a, a higher weighting towards providing liquidity. Uh, so what are the implications of this rewards payout function? Uh, market makers end up being able to maximize their profits uh, as long as their individual stake over the total stake is equivalent to their individual fees collected over the total fees collected. We refer to this as being fully staked. Uh, if there are mismatches in these ratios amongst all the different market makers, uh, the, there are actually some rewards that are not paid out in a single epoch. And these rewards end up being distributed to the next epoch. So what ends up happening is, let's say 80% of market makers are staked and 20% are just retail traders who don't really care to stake. The 20% of fees that are collected end up being re redistributed to the staked market makers, which should be the highest value market makers. We're essentially redirecting fees from price insensitive takers and arbitragers to these staked market makers. There's also, uh, there are also delegation mechanics uh, in, in the new protocol. So market makers can rent ZRX uh, in order to have a higher weighted stake. They can share a, per a fixed percentage of their rewards with delegators. Delegators also give 50% of their voting power to the market makers that they are staking with. Uh, and this creates a system where delegators are signaling who the most valuable market makers are by betting on their future rewards. So uh, this is kind of the flow of rewards. Uh, in this example, 25% is shared with, the, uh, with a single uh, market maker, and then 25% of those rewards are shared with all the delegators. Finally, there's a third challenge that I'm gonna cover today. Uh, decentralized exchanges don't yet have access to a lot of basic financial primitives. There's very limited support for bor borrowing and lending while simultaneously providing liquidity. Uh, there's limited access to derivatives used for hedging, uh, and probabilistic finality makes hedging difficult. Uh, so we can't directly address all these problems in version three, uh, but I'm primarily gonna focus on uh, a solution to this first issue of borrowing and lending while providing liquidity. We're starting to see DeFi infrastructure really, really improving. Uh, lending uh, in particular has started to see very good product market fit. Uh, this is a chart from just a few days ago taken from LoanScan. There are over $143 million of outstanding loans on DeFi protocols right now. This is also a chart from just a few days ago showing the total value locked in DeFi today. And, you know, this is a really amazing chart. It's crazy to see the growth of DeFi. And, and I think most people would agree when looking at this. But when I look at it, I also think, you know, this is capital that's not really being efficiently utilized. Most of it is locked in a single smart contract and only being utilized for one thing. Why can't these assets be utilized for multiple use cases at the same time? So this is uh, one of the goals in, in version 3.0 as well. We want to bridge all of this liquidity that's locked in DeFi uh, with liquidity that can be provided on 0x. So this uses the same exact mechanism uh, that I was talking about to bridge decentralized exchange liquidity with 0x. Uh, and you can use the same mechanism to earn interest on your assets while providing liquidity. Today, market makers are faced with a choice of lending out their assets for, let's say, 10% annualized interest or providing liquidity on 0x. And that could be a difficult trade-off. Uh, now you can do both at the same time. You can also utilize margin to scale your liquidity. Let's say you have $10,000 of assets. You could potentially provide you know, forty to $60,000 worth of liquidity with just $10,000. Uh, and finally, you can utilize margin to initiate short positions 
uh, removing the need to hold onto volatile assets. So maybe a market maker only needs to hold DAI or USDC, and they can take out loans of Ether against that in order to provide liquidity. And they're not constantly exposed to the price of Ether. Uh, they can just hedge out their exposure to that uh, as their orders are filled and always stay market neutral. You can also provide liquidity on multiple decentralized exchange protocols at the same time. Uh, and you can also use this mechanism to atomically hedge your positions as soon as they are filled, uh, which drastically lowers your risk. So I think this is actually a super impactful feature. Uh, you know, there's $600 million worth of assets locked in DeFi. These are people who are familiar with DeFi, they're familiar with smart contracts, they understand the UX, uh, some of the technical hurdles associated with it. These are exactly the users that we want to bring onto Zero X. Uh, and, and I think, you know, if we execute this correctly, uh, a good percentage of that value could end up being provided as liquidity on Zero X. So that's all I have for the presentation today. Um, if you want to learn more about any of these topics, there's a wealth of information out there. Uh, a few links here uh, describing the, the V3 launch. Uh, there, we're actually putting that to a vote on Monday of next week. So if you own ZRX, please get out there and vote. Um, the second link describes some of the liquidity incentives in much more detail. Uh, and then finally, if you want to learn kind of the low-level technical details of the smart contracts, uh, check out this last ZeroX improvement proposal, which links to all of the other proposals that are included in 3.0. Thank you for listening.